All right, brethren, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Paul begins in verse 21, and he says, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. Salute means to pull to oneself. That's what it means. They embraced. And, and he says, embrace every saint in Christ Jesus. Embrace them as being one with you in Christ, by Christ, and for Christ's sake. Embrace them. Salute them. Those God has called to faith in Christ are saints in Christ Jesus. You see there? Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. That's what we are by God's grace, saints in Christ Jesus. Scripture tells us that God the Father sanctified us in divine election when he chose whom he would in the Lord Jesus Christ. He separated us from everybody else in the world in Christ Jesus, and he told us in Ephesians 1 that according as he chose us in him, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And when he chose his people in Christ, in Christ God's people were holy and without blame and have always been holy and without blame in Christ. Yes, we fell. We, we were plunged into sin, but from eternity, by God sanctifying us, the Father, we've been holy and without blame in Christ. That's the only reason he didn't destroy this world when we fell in Adam. And then Christ came. We saw this morning in Isaiah 45. The Lord said, it's, few, it's useless to strive with your maker. And he said, I will send forth my son, like he sent forth Cyrus, and he said, and he shall deliver my captives. That's what Christ did. He came and redeemed his people from the captivity of the curse and condemnation of the law by his one offering at Calvary. He sanctified us. Hebrews 10 says, he, he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, thy law is within my heart. And he said, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus one time. By one offering, he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. As Isaac Watts, as we heard him in that hymn, we're as pure as God is pure in and by Christ Jesus, with Christ dwelling in us. And that's the third thing. The Lord said, not only will Christ come and redeem, deliver my captives, he said, he'll build my city. And we saw in Ephesians 2, God said, you're fellow citizens with the saints because Christ came and redeemed us that he might reconcile us to God in one body by the cross and he sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts through the preaching of the gospel. So we're fellow citizens with the saints and we're built up on the foundation of the apostles. He called out his apostles from among the Jews first and sent them forth with the gospel. Then he sent Paul to the elect Gentiles, just like God said he would in Isaiah 45. And Christ has been calling out his people and the Spirit of God sanctifies us in the heart when a new man's created, when Christ is formed in us in the, in the holiness of Christ so that we turn away from ourselves and all our works and we trust Christ alone to be all our righteousness and wisdom and sanctification and redemption. Sanctified, saints in the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul not only wanted the Philippians to greet every saint in Christ for him, he let them know, the brethren that are with me greet you. He said here, the, and it's brethren that are with me greet you. Now, we come to one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture. Speaking of the brethren with him, Paul said, verse 22, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. <laughs> That's what God said he's going to do in Isaiah 45. That's what he's still doing. That's what he did with you that believe him. That's what he said he'd do. In this one verse, we can learn so much about our God and our Savior and his salvation. But I want to show you three things. I'll show you three things. First of all, we learn that God our Father has elect in places we least expect them to be. He has elect in places we least expect them to be. God had elect in Rome in Caesar's household. Nothing about us, absolutely nothing about us, is a determining factor in God's electing grace. Nothing about us. 
while dead in sins, we used all of these things I'm about to talk about. We used all these things to exalt ourselves over others and despise others, trusting within ourselves that we were righteous. Every one of us did this. Every one of us. It's just fallen, sinful nature. But none of these things made us God's elect. Not our nation. They didn't make us God's elect. Paul said in Romans 9, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Even those that were born in the nation Israel, that didn't make them God's elect. They're not all Israel which are of Israel. Our text speaks of some of God's elect Gentiles in Rome, Italy. <laughs> not our earthly father. Not who our blood relations were. That didn't make us God's elect. He said, neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children. Abraham had Isaac, he had Ishmael. Isaac was a chosen child of God, but it, it wasn't because of Abraham. It's because of God's grace. Uh, Rebecca and Isaac had twins. She had twins in her womb. It didn't matter who their mother and father was. It was a God's electing grace that chose one and passed by the other. And it's not any of our works that make us God's child of grace. It's said of Jacob and Esau, the two having done neither good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. What is that? It's not of him that willeth. Listen to me carefully. You and me and no sinner on this planet are saved by our will. We're not saved by our will. We're saved by God's will. We're saved by Christ fulfilling the will of God. We're saved by God's will, not our will. Not of him that willeth, but of God that calleth. And it began in eternity when God called us his own children by electing grace in Christ Jesus. If we experience it in our experience when he calls us and makes us to know, you're my child, I've redeemed you, I've loved you from everlasting, and I shall save you to the end. God chose whom he would by his grace alone. And our God has had an elect remnant in every age. In every age. Adam was his elect. That's why he came to Adam and sought him in the garden. And Adam was running from him. Called him out. Stripped him of his fig leaves. Slew a lamb in his place. And covered him in the coats of those skins. In every age, God's had an elect. And in every country from among all people throughout the world. We, we, we get in these arguments over race. Your race don't have one thing to do with who you, if you're saved or not. And John saw him sing a new song saying, Christ is worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou was slain. Thou was slain. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. God our Father has a lake where, where we least expect them, brethren. Where we least expect them. Now you remember, when you encounter somebody who, when, if you get an opportunity to speak the gospel to them and they object, don't be high-minded. Don't think that you know something and you got a leg up on somebody. Paul said, be not high-minded but fear. The only way you believe is by the grace of God. That's the only way. They may be God's elect. They may be beloved of God. They may be a true child of Abraham like you turned out to be. So speak the word. Be patient. Pray to God to bless it. Trust him to bless it. Scripture says only the special people of God, only the elect are those that God saves. But here's what it says of every one of us. Here's what it says of every one of us. God hath concluded them all. All his elect, he's concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. <laughs> You're going to be saved, you'll be saved by mercy. That's true of elect Jews and Gentiles. Secondly, we learn we can trust our sovereign Savior is able. Now this is so vital. We learn from this one verse that our sovereign Savior, Christ our head, our Redeemer, head of the church, he's able He's able to overrule the sins and the errors in judgment of his preacher and 
teach his people the gospel through that preacher and save his people and teach his people about Christ in the process as he, as he saves his preacher and corrects his preacher. How do you get that out of this verse? How did Paul end up in Rome? How did this begin? Well, back in Acts, in Acts uh, 21, Paul went to Jerusalem to bring a gift from God's elect Gentiles to the elect that had been called out among, from among the Jews, to the church at Jerusalem. And while he's in Jerusalem, James and him were talking. James is a Jew. Paul was a, he, he was a Jew, but he's the preacher to the Gentiles. And uh, James said in Acts 21, 21, he said, uh, well, tw Acts 20, 20, he said, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law, zealous of the law. And they're informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs come together. He said, we're going to have a, one of the biggest assemblies here that we've ever had. He said, we're they fit to all come together here. You're going to have a big platform to preach. And he said, and they'll hear it because they're going to hear you come. But James didn't say, so stand up, preach Christ and crucified to them. That's not what he's asked him to do. He said, what is it therefore? He said, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that these things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keeps and keep the law. And it says, and then Paul took the men, verse 26, then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishing of the days of purification, so that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And almost seven days go by, Paul does this. He comes under a, a, a Jewish vow, under a legal vow, because these men can't pay their debt. And he's going to be at charges on their behalf. And James says, and that'll show all the people that you really walk under the law and orderly according to the law. And this will bring them all together. We'll all be in harmony. This is the same apostle Paul and, and Paul did this. This is the same Apostle Paul who faithfully, boldly rebuked the Apostle Peter and said to him, when he got up from that table with the, with the Gentiles and walked over and sat down at the table with the Jews because he saw James and these other Jews approaching. This is the same Paul that told him, you are not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And you're leading others away from the gospel to dissimulate and follow after, after what you're doing. Same Paul. This is the same Paul who boldly stood up to the Judaizers when they came down and told the Gentile believers that except you be circumcised and come under the law, you cannot be saved. Paul said, we didn't withstand them for a minute. Same Apostle Paul. And yet he did what James suggested. Brethren, I don't know if you realize this. That is a very, very grievous sin that Paul committed. It was a rank denial of Christ. It was not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Christ was already made under the law. Christ came and he paid all the debt his people owed. He, he took the charges that we owed and paid everything his people owed. Everything that was pictured in that vow and pictured in, in that law, everything about it was given by God to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and by his blood, by his righteousness, Christ fulfilled that type. 
He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. He fulfilled it. It would have been better for Paul to stand up and declare this very thing to those, that multitude and preach Christ and him crucified and the accomplishment that he accomplished for his people and declare to them, therefore, God's people who've been called by Christ Jesus are not under the law, you're under grace. This would have been the thing to declare to them. We don't walk because we're compelled by men. We don't walk because we're compelled by law, by threats of law and promises of reward. We do what we do in honor to our Savior because he's given us a love for the Redeemer and seeing what he's done for us and how he's made us righteous and holy and complete in him. We're constrained by his love for us. That's why we live unto him, not by law. If we could see how evil Paul's sin was, then we would see the grace of God magnified to the highest right here. This was worse than murder. This was, this was worse than what David did when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then killed her husband. When Peter moved from that Gentile table, Paul said, you walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That's what Paul did that day. But see, God our Father chose the Apostle Paul by grace. Christ Jesus had come and worked out a perfect righteousness for Paul. He'd been born of the Spirit of God. There was a new man in Paul created in the perfect holiness of our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul was doing was just a weakness of his his, his new man was weak and his old man was strong. And though he did what he did, we see the sovereign, unchangeable love and grace of God in what Christ did for Paul. Christ is the righteousness and holiness of his people. And he's the sanctifier who first separated us into his holiness and who is able to keep us separated into his holiness even when we do something as foolish as what Paul did and we do a lot of foolishness like Paul did Christ is able to overrule the sins and this was a terrible error in judgment but he's able to overrule the sins and the, and the errors of judgment in his preacher as well as in his people, and to teach every one of us in the process. So our so sovereign Lord did that. He didn't permit that offering to be made. When those seven days were almost finished, it, it tells us here in Acts 21, it just the Jews were stirred up. They saw him, and they, they grabbed him. It says, verse 27, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is a man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and polluted this holy place. They had seen him before, they thought. And it says in all the, verse 30, all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. Now look at this. And forthwith the doors were shut. <laughs> Who did that? Christ did that. We saw in Isaiah 45, he said, I create peace and I create evil. That was wicked Gentile, uh, uh, unbelieving Jews that drug him out of that temple and went to accusing him of preaching against the law and the, everything they had confidence in, their holy place and the law. And, and the Lord slammed the doors shut to the temple. He didn't let him offer that offering. He slammed the door shut because Christ is the one door into God's presence. You don't come through the law. You come through faith in the Lord Jesus. He shut the door because Christ already fulfilled everything that was typified in that offering and perfected his people forever, paid all the debt we owed. So the unbelieving Jews, they take Paul out and they bind him and they beat him. They almost killed him. But Christ stopped them. You know what he did? He gave Paul a platform, and there's all this angry multitude standing before him. And Paul did what he should have done the first time. He preached Christ to him. <laughs> he preached Christ to him. Is God able to overrule the errors and sins of his people? That's what he did with Paul. 
Paul declared how he had once persecuted this way, persecuted God's saints unto the death, delivering men and women to prison. He said, but he told them how Christ interrupted him on the road to Damascus and put him face down in the dirt and spoke to him in power. And for the first time, he bowed to Christ and said, what wilt thou have me to do? He preached that to him. Then the Lord Jesus used men to deliver Paul to the Jewish council. They take him to the Jewish council now. And what did he do there? He preached Christ to them. And then as he lay in prison, go to Acts 23. As he lay in prison that night, beaten, bruised, probably mourning over what he had done. And verse 11 says, In the night following, Acts 23, 11, The night following, the Lord stood by him. Oh, <laughs> the Lord is always standing by his people. <laughs> oh, the night followed, the Lord stood by him. And he said, Be a good cheer, Paul. <laughs> That's not what the Pharisees would have said. <laughs> if you disobeyed them, that's not what they'd have said. That's what Christ says to his people. Why? He's the righteousness of his people. God says for his sake, I remember you sin no more. Christ already bore the sin Paul committed at Jerusalem and put it away before God. You know, Christ comes to him in mercy and says, be a good cheer, Paul. <laughs> now watch. For... for and he don't even mention what Paul did in trying to make that vow. He says, as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, as you preach the gospel of me faithfully in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. <laughs> you see that? Christ didn't even regard what he did. Christ, Christ just regarded what Christ worked in him, where Christ lifted him up and gave him a platform and he preached Christ to the people. He said, you faithfully testified of me. Now you're going to do it at Rome too. More than 40 of the unbelieving Jews at that time, they, they were so zealous for the law and they're such holy men, such righteous men. They bound themselves with an oath that they would not eat or drink anything until they assassinated Paul. That's holy men, isn't it? We're not going to eat or drink anything until we kill this man for preaching Christ. So the Lord used Paul's nephew to tell him, and then he sent, him, sent the nephew to the Roman guard, and his little nephew runs into the Roman guard, and so the Romans, <laughs> now Paul couldn't have worked this out. He couldn't have done this on his own. He had to make tents just to give one town to the other. But the Lord provided 200 Roman soldiers and footed the bill to deliver Paul safely to Caesarea. Armed guard gave him a, <laughs> they gave him a, they surrounded him and carried him safely to Caesarea. What did he do when he got there? He preached to the governor and he preached to King Agrippa. And then he preached to more of the Jews. You know who did that? The Lord did that. Lord Jesus did all that. Paul told him there in Acts 26, 21, he said, For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me, having therefore obtained help of God. <laughs> I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And so Paul appealed to Caesar, the highest ruler in the land. He appealed to Caesar. So they loaded him on a ship, put him on a ship, paid the way to bring him to Rome. And the Lord sent a hurricane. He sent a hurricane while he was on that ship. Paul stood up. Look at Acts 27. Now, I'm trying to show you the Lord's able to brew the sin of his preacher and use him to preach the gospel and teach his people in the process. He's teaching me and you right now through Paul, what Paul, how Paul sinned and how the Lord overruled it and taught him. He's teaching me and you right now what Christ's able to do. 
And he did that the whole way, everywhere Paul went while it was happening. Paul preaching the gospel. Now look here, he's on this ship. The Lord sent the hurricane in Acts 26, 21. I mean, uh, Acts 27, 22. And Paul stood up and he said, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me. <laughs> there he is again, standing by Paul. The Lord's standing by his people. The Lord stood by me this night, there stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and, whose, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. <laughs> You can't die, Paul. you got to be brought to Caesar. You must be. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it should be even as it was told me. But here's what else Christ told him. He told them, how be it? We must be cast upon a certain island. <laughs> Before we get to Caesar, we got to be cast on a certain island. And so Christ shipwrecked Paul on that island where he healed a man. And what did he do? Preach the gospel to him. Some barbarians. Christ used those barbarians to load Paul and the men with everything they needed for the rest of their trip. Load them up. What did, what did Paul tell us? In, he's in, when he's writing a Philippian letter, he's in jail at Rome, and he said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul learned that all through his life, but I, he learned it on that, on that barbarian island too, Malta, because the Lord used him to just load him up with everything he needed for the rest of that trip. And the Lord delivered Paul to Caesar in Rome. In Acts 28, 23. Why don't you turn over there. Acts 28, 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning to evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And among those that heard the gospel, there was a man named Onesimus, who was God's elect, who had robbed Philemon, and he fled, and he, and he ran to Rome to get away. And the Lord led him right there to Paul, and he heard Paul preach the gospel, and God saved him. Paul sent him back, said, now receive him. He's a servant of the Lord now. But Christ doing all of that with Paul and delivering him to preach in Rome, Paul was able to write in Philippians 4.22, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. <laughs> Don't you, isn't that, that just, uh, Christ is our sovereign Savior, brethren. He's the head of his church. He's his, he is as really in the presence of his people as he was when he walked this earth. He's that present with his people right now. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. We see him standing by Paul over and over and over and over. He's the one that slammed them doors shut and wouldn't let Paul off that offering. I tell you, he'll let you go so far to show you that in your flesh dwells no good thing, but then he's slamming the door shut on it. And he'll teach you he's your savior in the process and he'll use you to tell other people, this is my God whom I serve. <laughs> he, he's serving me, keeping me, preserving me, and I serve him. And he'll, 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 that's how he's going to teach you that this doctrine is not just theory. It's real. It's Christ himself working it in his people. He's going to teach you this doctrine. And then how are you going to learn not to touch a hot stove? When you touch a hot stove, and he's going to save you from that and heal you from that, and he's going to keep you coming back teaching whoever will listen to you and saying, Christ is the only Savior. He's the head. He's the sovereign. He's the righteousness. He's the wisdom. He's the light. He's the truth. He's the bread. He's the Jehovah Rapha, for the Lord that healeth thee. He's Jehovah Sid Canu, the Lord our righteousness. He's everything his people need, and there is no other. There's no other God but him. Lastly, we can learn a lot more from this. We could look, <laughs> there's a lot more to learn from this. But lastly, we learn Christ is able to bring the gospel to his lost sheep and make it effectual in their hearts. Before the foundation of the world, when God elected his people in Christ, God also predestinated his people 
to the very moment he would send them the gospel and they would hear the gospel preached and the Spirit of God would regenerate them and they would experience the adoption of children. He predestinated that. And he did it so that Christ might get all the glory. That's why he did it. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that his Son might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. He does the calling. Them he called. Them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What are we going to say to this? If God's for you, there ain't a soul that can be against you. Just look at Paul. And Christ knows where his lost sheep are. Even among the unbelieving Jews and the unbelieving Gentiles, he knows right where his sheep are. Even if they're on a, on a barbarian island, he knows where his sheep, sheep are. And he's able to shipwreck his preacher there if he has to, so he'll preach the gospel to them. You must be cast on a certain island. Even if they're a runaway slave, running away with their master's goods and they think they've, they've succeeded and they've gotten away with it, the Lord will direct them straight to his gospel preacher and he'll make them hear the gospel and he'll save them. Even if they're born in a wealthy, wealthy Roman Caesar's household, a Gentile that never had the law, never had the word of God, never even heard the gospel. God's able to deliver his Paul there and tell him, you must preach the gospel right here. I got some people here. <laughs> That's, oh, listen, in Christ, when he sends his preacher to his lost sheep, he always accomplishes his will through his word. He always accomplishes it. Isaiah 55, 10 Isaiah 55, 10, he said, Just like the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not hither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. For you shall go out with joy, and you shall be led forth with peace. That's the word of our Lord. Why is it? Why is it that this strong delusion has come over men where man has become so proud and arrogant that he thinks he can control the climate? Why? To deny that very word right there. God said, I send the snow, I send the rain. It accomplishes my purpose. It gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And it never failed because it's a picture. I made it to picture my word that never fails but accomplishes my purpose. That's why the devil is has been permitted to put in the heart of men this foolishness, the audacity of it. I'm not here to talk politics, but I'm just saying to you, I want you to see, I don't worry about any of that stuff. Let the partridge try with the partridge. Why? Because God has he's based his covenant on the fact you can't break the covenant with the day and the night, so you can't break my covenant with my elect people. He said... As the rain comes down and the snow and waters and accomplish my purpose, he says, so my word does. So he created all things. Christ created all things by him and for him were they created. Our Lord didn't walk along and look at illustrations and pick up a corn of wheat and say, see how that corn of wheat falls in the ground and it must die and it brings forth fruit. That, that pictures me. He didn't just find something after the fact that pictures him. He made it to picture him. <laughs> He made a corn, piece of corn to fall in the ground and a corn of wheat fall in the ground and have to be broken and crushed and fall into the earth and die before life can come up out of it because that's what Christ did for his people. He's the seed that came down into this earth and went to the cross and was broken in the place where he went from him. Life comes, the vine, and his people are branches in the vine. The same reason, i tell you why he sent him there. Remember he said, he's talking to some Jewish folks, and he said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Not of, I have some elect not of this Jewish fold. He said, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Why must he bring them? Why must he bring all his people? Why must his word not return void? Because he entered covenant with the Father that he would bring every one of God's elect to the Father and present, them, present us to him without spot and without blemish. 
unreprovable in his sight. He promised that. And not only that, he came and laid down his life and justified his people, and God's holy justice has been satisfied, and his holy character and justice demands they must be called out of darkness into his light. And that's why he says he will not fail. So he has set judgment in the earth. He's done it at the cross. He's going to do it in the hearts of his people. Even so, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace, and if it's by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. The only reason this world stays in, is held in store right now is what Peter's told, told uh, in, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. He said, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to usward, to his elect, to those Christ redeemed, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so therefore he said, you account that the long-suffering of God shall end in the salvation of all his people. God's will can't be frustrated. God will see to it that his elect shall hear the gospel. They'll be granted repentance and faith to believe on him. Christ said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What a word. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Listen, God has a remnant all over this world, places you don't, you'd never expect. If you get the opportunity to speak the gospel to them, speak the gospel. Be patient. Don't, don't, don't get all haughty and arrogant if they don't believe. You couldn't believe either. Only by God's grace. Just keep being patient, speaking the word. As a preacher, you learn this. You, you can't make anybody believe anything. You preach, preach, preach. One day folks act like they never heard a word you said. Only the Lord can make the word effect. Just keep preaching the gospel. Number two, trust Christ to rule over the sins of his preacher and the sins of his people and teach you in the process. I had a preacher tell me that one time. I was finding fault with my pastor. and He came, he said, you believe your Savior is sovereign? I said, I do. He said, why don't you trust your pastor to him? I never thought of that. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Just trust my Lord. And speak the word, knowing that it never returns to him void. It shall accomplish what he sends it to accomplish. That's our, that's our redeemer, brethren. <laughs> All right. Brother Greg.